What are you talking about? Are you drinking whiskey straight from the bottle? No, I'm not there? drinking whiskey. Yeah, this is tea. Oh, although it's it doesn't tea. like it's Tahava <laughs> brand tea. <laughs> it, it's a it high does... quality unsweetened tea. Yeah, I can although, vouch for it. Although it does look like a 40. So <laughs> if if you took the labor off, it would be hard to tell this from Mad Dog 2020. So <laughs> uh, you've, got, you've got yet to enjoy the wonders of Bookfast. It makes you fuck fast. Has anybody ever had book fast? No. What? <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm afraid not. I'm afraid not. Now, what book kind fast. of fuck fast do you mean? Yeah, do you mean you finish faster or? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm no, pretty it's sure it's the, the like get get fucked fast. Yeah, right? yeah, totally get fucked fast. And it's it's made by in in like an abbey by some monks somewhere in England, and it's this what? tonic <laughs> wine. Seriously, <laughs> it's, it's oh. a. It's oh a God. tonic wine that's about fifteen percent, and they lace it with Tory, basically like Red Bull mixed with like fortified wine. And you buy a bottle of it; it was really cheap, about seven pounds. And you drink it, and I swear to God, it's better than drugs. It was better than drugs. It was like, is, is, a little is like that. Drug. What the monks take too? Is that, is that what the yeah. monks take too? Well, keep our mind on holy things. Yeah. Tanya, when yeah. I drink it, I would. It was like I would be on. I would just be. I'd be away for like fucking about eight hours. You would be so, nearly in a state of. You're, you're telling me that that Buckfast is like monastic for loco. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's what it sounds like. Yeah, and <laughs> it, 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 there's a place. You can go on YouTube. There's like there's a kind of a one of these meme things on YouTube of people downing a bottle of Buckfast and like in one go. It's, and it's not pretty, but like uh, they, there's a there's a there's a place in there's a place in Glasgow, and it's actually called. Uh, Buckfast Triangle, and it's like it's like these three neighborhoods, like the former triangle, and apparently it, it consumes like you know an incredible amount of Buckfast. I, you know, I have dealt with grass regions when I lived in North Africa, and they can drink. Holy crap. Although you can't understand them when they drink because they speak Glaswegian, which I suppose is a form of English, but no one else on earth seems to be able to translate them. <laughs> one of my precious's uh, best friends from college, he has his idea for a book series. It's like Scots in Space. <laughs> <laughs> He has them all like laid out, but he hasn't written any of them yet. But it sounds like a fucking brilliant idea. Scott's in space. Okay, Jimmy. Hello, and welcome to the 24th episode of Karl Marx's 18th premiere of Louis Napoleon Reading Group series. Today is Sunday, the 21st of March, 2021, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. This week, we start the final chapter, Chapter 7, The Summary. And boy, what a summary do we have on our hands. Marx dials his analytical genius all the way up to 11. This week, I have the new patrons, Wes, Diazzi, Set Small, Podcast Listener 42069, and the returning Bernie Vapes and Simon Bergstrom to thank. I have big news for all you patrons out there. Starting next Sunday, March 28th, 12pm EST and 5pm GMT, we'll be starting a new Patreon-only reading group series of my recent obsession, The Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution. We'll be reading the second edition, which I'll leave a link to in the show notes, there is some confusion over the different versions, so make sure if you're interested in joining that you get the correct edition. It costs £11 in the UK, so probably around $15 for most people. We'll be reading one chapter each week, and the chapters average about 15 pages, so it's not that much reading. There are 17 chapters in the entire book, so it should take us about 16-17 weeks to do all going well. The sessions will be recorded and edited and released to GenPop in due course. So, if you'd like to take part, head on over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. You'll also get access to all the Patreon-only episodes and the Emancipation Network Discord server, where you can berate me, like so many others, in real time. Your continued support really does help to keep the episodes flowing and feed my starving children. Okay. Let's hit it. 
So we're here finally at chapter seven, the last chapter, which is a kind of a, a closing chapter where he wraps up a lot of the stuff and gives us his kind of analysis of the of the class nature of Bonaparte's actual rule. So let's uh, kick it off here in the first uh, couple of paragraphs here where he kind of um, just wraps up what's after happening. Uh, normally we go to Kyle. Kyle, how do you feel about kicking off? All right. So the social republic appeared as a phrase, as a prophecy on the threshold of the February Revolution. In the June days of 1848, it was drowned in the blood of the Paris proletariat, but it haunts the subsequent acts of the drama like a ghost. The Democratic Republic announces its appearance. It is dissipated on June 13, 1849, together with its deserting petty bourgeois, but in its flight, it redoubles its boastfulness. The Parliamentary Republic, together with the bourgeoisie, takes possession of the entire state, it enjoys its existence to the full, but December 2nd, 1851, buries it to the accompaniment of the anguish, anguish cry of the coalesced royalists. Uh, long live the Republic! The French bourgeoisie balked at the domination of the working proletariat. It has brought the lumpen proletariat to domination with the chief of the society of December 10th at its head. The bourgeoisie kept France in breathless fear of the future terrors of red anarchy. Bonaparte, Bonaparte discounted this future for it when, on December 4th, he had the eminent bourgeois of the Boulevard Montmartre and the Boulevard des Italiens shot down at their windows by the drunken army of law and order. The bourgeoisie apotheized the sword. The sword rules it. It destroyed the revolutionary press. Its own press is destroyed. It placed popular meetings under police surveillance. Its salons are placed under police supervision. It disbanded the Democratic National Guard. Its own National Guard is disbanded. It imposed a state of siege. A state of siege is imposed upon it. It supplanted the juries by military commissions. Its juries are supplanted by military commissions. It subjected public education to the sway of the priests. The priests subject it to their own education. It jailed people without trial. It is being jailed without trial. It suppressed every stirring, every stirring in society by means of state power. Every stirring in its society is suppressed by means of state power. Out of enthusiasm for its money bags, it rebelled against its own politicians and literary men. Its politicians and literary men are swept aside, but its money bag is being plundered now that its mouth has been gagged and its pen broken. The bourgeoisie never tired of crying out to the revolution, what St. Arsenius cried out to the Christians. Fuge tasse quiese. Flee, be silent, keep still. Bonaparte cries to the bourgeoisie, fuge tasse quiesse. The, the French bourgeoisie had long ago found the solution to Napoleon's dilemma. In 50 years, Europe will be Republican or Cossack. It solved it in the Cossack Republic. No Circe using black magic has distorted that work of art, the bourgeois republic, into a monstrous shape. That republic has lost nothing but the semblance of respectability. Present-day France was already contained in the parliamentary republic. It required only a bayonet thrust for the bubble to burst and the monster to leap forth before our eyes. Marx can write. Marx can write. Yeah, when he puts his damn mind to it, his, his pen is pretty ruthless. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, he doesn't put his damn mind to it that much after 1860-something. So. Yeah, it's because he's like, <laughs> let's try to reform calculus. Okay. like I don't know. I've, I've been reading a lot of um, the theories of surplus value okay. that he wrote towards the end of his life. And he is, oh my God, he is so clear and just slam dunk uh, debunk after slam dunk debunk and uh, it's just a joy I'll, to I'll read. Give you, I'll give you uh, theories of surplus like, value. That's funny. Like. Yeah, but 
But other than that, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, you got I'm about to say we, we we shall not mention most of Capital Volume Three. <laughs> volume Volume Two is worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, no, I, I yeah, think Volume it, Three is 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 clear and and uh, and snappy compared to two. But but yeah. Um. So what do we have here? We have a funny tale of the bourgeoisie and basically emboldening the state to kick its own ass. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a just a side of my brain that's like, oh yeah, this is kind of like when the S payday set up the Fry Corps to kill the communists, and then the, the or, or you know emboldened the Fry Corps to kill the communists, and then the Fry Corps killed them. <laughs> like, um, whoops. So the moral of this story is be very careful with the petite bourgeois and the lump and proletariat because they can go all over the place and cause lots and lots and lots of havoc. Uh huh. Yep. <clears throat> As we've seen again and again, it's a dangerous game. Is there anything it's, to stick? Go on, it, go on Derek, No, it's interesting to me, though, that, that like, left is trying to use the Lumpen as a main force is, like, a constant theme of modern left theorizing is, like, how to get the Lumpen on the side of the left since the proletariat won't do what we want it to. And I'm just like, so you're going to pick an even more unstable force that has all kinds of counter incentives to be weird because they're desperate, like, but not in a way that <sighs> anyway. Yeah. I'm gonna, yeah. If I, I mean, continue this, yeah. someone's going to call me a reactionary, but like, yeah, no, no, I, I completely agree with that. Like if, if there was anything I, I, I took with me about the, the, uh, love and proletariat stuff in, uh, in, um, uh, in, in the Brumaire, um it's that the, all of the talk about you know uh we got to reach out to the disenfranchised people that um uh, that trump reached out to like all of that is fucking bullshit uh well, that's bullshit why trump we don't need class. them on our side they never were on our side and, and and it's just it's just um it's just fascinating how like this whole thing begins with uh um so I don't know if it's in the English preface, but in the in the Swedish preface, he's like, "So, uh, hey guys, I'm Karl Marx. I'm going to tell you the story about how a clown came to power, uh, who no one took seriously, and now everything is fucked, um, and uh, he 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 did that by uh, partially using the the lump and proletariat and." You know, it's it's just so disheartening to see. I mean, it one of the things I'll say that. is is it doesn't entirely rhyme because because Trump is not really empowered by the lumpen proletariat. He might be empowered by the lumpen bourgeoisie. By that, I which mean like like people with mm -hmm. sketchy land deals and quasi mob connections. But like, um, which is you know its own its own special problem. But it's interesting to but hear I mean, people. He, he, he does name, um, at least in the Swedish translation, he does name um, uh, like owners of gambling dens and uh, pimps and brothel owners uh, as as part of the lumpen. Uh, so, like, yeah, our, the, the category. I first of all, this category sucks. Like, it's wildly <laughs> inconsistent. Let, Second let, of all, let, 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 when you're in the United States and Everything's been deindustrialized, and all the jobs have been shipped, and you're not left with much of a proletariat. And what you do have is like bought off by trade unions. Like, I, I think there is some problems with trying to make the lump in like the main revolutionary subject. However, I understand why people go there as from like mm. the new left forward. Yeah, because if you want to be like democratic, you're thinking about the majority of the population. The majority of the population is like fucked on the value for him. It's not like they don't have to work. It's just like everything's a hustle. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah. It, it, I mean, if we want a minoritarian, like, it, you know, workerist, supremacist kind of like politics, then fine. But, you know, if we yeah, want but that like wasn't a, true yeah. when like the Panthers were, I, that, I, that I, wasn't I, true when the Panthers were saying that. And I actually don't believe no, it's true now. Fair. It's, it's fair, it's fair I, about I, the Panthers, but I don't know. Like, uh, look at... Uh, trends in like mass underemployment because right because we're not talking about people that are like 
because this is the thing, the line between lumpen proletariat and proletariat proper is extraordinarily blurred. And that's, that's like, and we're going to see more of that in this chapter when Marx tries to pin down exactly what the force the was in, in, uh, Bonaparte's favor. Uh, mm. it's, mm. yeah, it's quite, uh, vague. Like it, it, it's, it's a coalition of things that he's trouble categorizing. So I, yeah. I think we're going to get into this a bit, some more. The, the theory Which, that emerges, by the way, totally rhymes with with the uh, uh, political boundaries of today that are also kind of blurred. Uh, the, the, yeah. the, the theory that emerges what, what, what in the total fuck are is that Bonaparte is doing with the you know grab him by the pussy guy. Like how did how did that dude get the get the female Christian vote? Like a, it's shit, shit's court. blurry and it's always blurry. I mean, Supreme Christian, court. It's 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 complicated, but the theory that's emerging here, or the, the the perhaps the description, the theoretical description, it's like one part description, one part theory, right? Is that Bonaparte is of the lumpen proletariat, led essentially a conspiracy of the lumpen proletariat to hijack the state and give it some relative autonomy between classes. However, is ultimately expressing a decaying petty proprietor, small peasant class interest that cannot be expressed because it's being economically undermined. The, the latter part of that isn't here, but the conspiracy of the lumpen proletariat is. So that's like a very weird yeah. class state nexus theoretical right. postulate. Right. And I think that that's actually very important for now because I, I think if we like look really looked at the lumpen stuff, if we like if if, and I'm actually going to insist on using the lumpen bourgeoisie because like there's a difference between owning shit that's sketchy and gig working that's sketchy. There's a really big difference. Um, that you might have lumpen lumpen bourgeoisie elements in the Trump coalition. I mean, particularly with all these like quasi mobbed up appointees and shit like that. That's that's real. But what you, what what the analysis of a supporters fails to get that I like I me I mentioned Michael Lind who actually does talk about this, is like you actually have strong petite bourgeois support for Trump in deracinated areas, um, that have nothing to do with the cultural politics of it. Really, it has to do with fear of the left and fear of losing uh, of losing what little tiny profits they have, and also. And we haven't talked about this, but it may apply. I don't know how much it applies in France. The brain drain of the of 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 the cities from the periphery within the country, um, which which has led to since there are no jobs, everyone who's got any prospects at all runs to these cities to try to get into, you know, the you know a prof higher skill proletariat and and low key bourgeois jobs that are 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 things that have professional in the sense that they're dependent on the state and because I mean, that's where the work is and and that's where there's there is a fair amount of it um but only in those areas which also like feeds a feedback loop where like it's not just that these people are you know i, mean, I think actually like when we talk about right now the whole like pedophilia they're stealing our kids thing is actually like almost a, a fucked up subconscious metaphor for for that because because these areas are losing their young like to these major cities which also can't can't provide them but when they come back they're culturally different uh can, it's it's really increasing tensions and i think there's a lot of like if you wanted to take a psychoanalytic approach which i don't often want to do actually but like there's a lot of stuff going on in there i wonder how much it rhymes i would actually have to look at stuff beyond this text to know like i'd have to get like a good like what was actually going on in the french countryside um at the time yeah to really make the comparison yeah mo Locke is eating yeah. our kids yeah mm -hmm. well like yeah. Well, one thing i think that'd be very wary of talking about trump with like lumpen is that like if you were to actually go and analyze the lumpen in america like most of them don't vote and most of them it's not like trump got new voters yeah, really very true. they're not new voters it's just amplifying a a different basically pr he, strategy to attract those same voters pretty much he I, also yeah he but, also but, hasn't uh 
he hasn't um, built a base of support around uh, state employees in the way that Marx uh, describes in this chapter. Like, you could say, you know, like, uh, like Homeland Security is maybe the closest thing you could see there to, like, the comparison of, like, what Marx says about these, like, uh, lumpen people who find employment with the state and therefore are loyal to uh, Bonaparte. Uh, but I, I, I feel like there's, there's, a, there's a distinction uh, between these, these two cases here. Well, honestly, yeah. if you want I, 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 I want to give my anecdotal evidence just to corroborate what Tom was saying that like, um, I, I did some, you know, uh, NGO work for like a few weeks before I took that job and shoved it and was trying to do voter registration. And, you know, where do uh, like people who will fund voter registration want to, you know, what population do they want to get engaged? Well, you know, they stuck me next to the projects. Right. And so like, I can tell you, there was very little fucking interest in registering to vote. And where there was interest, they were not allowed to vote because they were felons. So like this thing about the political, you know, oh, yeah, right. in, like the pol like <laughs> the political expression of the lumpen proletariat is complete disengagement, if not disenfranchisement in I the mean, United States. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. What, what, what the, the, the and, and and that's a really good point. I, I, I keep forgetting that you don't have universal suffrage in the United States. Um, uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, no, I mean, our, the, um, no, that, that is that is that is <laughs> true. Our political scientists um, say we do, but they're it's like saying, oh, the unemployment rate. You know, it's just like a made up. You know, like yeah, ideological. Yeah, but, 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 it's not really universal what, suffrage. I, I guess I guess they're 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 just two things. Uh, reading the Brumaire vis-a-vis like um, uh, like a, a a strong man um, troll clown uh, playing with the lump that worries me and and uh, number one is this kind of shows that um, you know if you can get the 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 you know drug dealers on the block on your side and conspire with them you can do a lot of like scary shit. Um, and, um, uh, and also like w what you said about them being disenfranchised, uh, I take that to be kind of the case here as well, that they were disenfranchised. They were apolitical. Here comes this guy who gives them, you know, military uniforms, although they're not in the military, um, uh, gives them champagne and 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 sausage, and you know uh, awesome. tries to yeah. convince oh, them and, and and get these uh, get them on on his side, and um, like it, it's a it's a it's a force you can tap into. It's an exploitable class, um, as it were. Um, uh, yeah. If you can tap into that kind of sentiment. So, so that, that, yeah, that's kind of proletariat by its very nature, by its very nature, it feels like, man, if only I could get exploited, like that's the whole thing. Like they, they're locked out of the wage yeah. form. Right. If, I, um, if I roll with this guy, I don't have to hustle. Which, you know, you let's, know. let's, let's talk about like the one legitimate point that Maoist had about this uh, question is they would, is they would, they would try to employ them and it, it had mixed results like you know some most of the time people would take to it although occasionally they would just also just go in and shoot prostitutes but um the also lumpen yeah the um the the thing that i find interesting though is not so much the lumpen area of this is is when you have all these areas where you have hybrid and breakdown classes which that does rhyme with now um because because when you look at like where commodity production is, that's not really in most of the developed world that much, except for Germany, weirdly. Um, when you look at like, uh, I mean, yes, there's a ton of commodities being made in the United States, but they're made by robots and by prisoners. Like, um, well, so services, services are, are, are commodities too, but like it's, it's more than yeah, you're talking about the industrial stuff. Yeah, right. outside of outside of uh, military uh, in the UK, it's military uh, is the only real industry that's really left. A little bit of car, but that that's it. 
I mean, we have we have more finishing products and stuff here than you know, but it's it, it's mostly it really is mostly done by robots. One of the things about like like the Nagel appeals to this sort of thing and breaking back the traditional industrial working class that they want to do is like it's not reshoring won't do it because reshore like offshoring isn't even the primary problem. Like a lot of those, a lot of that manufacturing work has come back to the United States. It just doesn't employ anyone, not not at scale. Like where it used to employ five thousand people, it now employs fifty, um, and can be way more productive. So the rate of exploitation is actually quite high. Um, so like, I think I, I think that you we have to be honest something about these weird these weird hybrid uh, positions, and then all these things that are dependent on the state, because one thing I will say, no, Trump has not like done the state employee thing. Honestly, you know who did that in America? LBJ and FBR. That was their, their game. Yeah. The new deal. Yeah, yeah, great absolutely. Society. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, and that's um, like why, why like, like the black community has always been big on, uh, on government jobs. Cause it was like, they would, they could get them um, and yeah. get out of like quasi hustle, AKA practically lumping, you know, yeah. job sectors. Um, but like, as a side note, like we have all this breakdown with all these weird, like people try to do it with the PMC. They try to do it with all these other class theories right now. But what you really have is a bunch of people who are like working class part of the day, maybe depending on what's going on, or they're dependent on the state indirectly. And that includes a lot of, but that includes a lot of the bourgeois class in America because, like, frankly, venture capital stuff is like so prompted up by the state right now that I mean, and I'm people don't seem to get this, but like it, like there's so much backdoor prompting of inefficient and basically insane businesses by through like pro propping up rentier models that you do see something like this. It's just not. It just doesn't look like the way Marx is describing the lump no. in here. No, it looks like, it looks like startup bros. Right. Like it looks like, you know, I'm going to be Bill Gates, like kind of like, kind of like um, cult shit. Like, I don't know. Like if you go to Silicon Valley, there's a bunch of like startup bros that have little cults of personality, get people to work like 70 hour weeks, you know, on like sweat equity and bullshit. Like, it's, it's like uh, it's like starting a newspaper, right? And anyway, so I, oh my god, I yeah. And that. I want I want to talk about that too because like th there's a lot of people right now in in America, particularly around the disenfranchised parts of the DSA, who are like picking up on this Negolite language, and like that's a code, and it's a code for it's a code for like basically right right ethnicism, honestly, and for a class it has does not only doesn't exist in the United States right now really hasn't existed that way in the United States since it probably the middle sixties. So like, like in a way, like one of the things I think is trying to, is, is going on is trying to turn, trying to turn like even working classism into a kind of identity politics, which is fucked up. And I think you see mm -hmm. something like that here. I, I, I mean, I kind of do. Yeah. Well, that, that's the, like th th this, is, this is why I love you, Derek, because like nothing of what you said has anything to do with the text we just read, <laughs> but it's so interesting that I don't, I don't want to cut in and like, anyway, moving on. <laughs> uh, I Speaking the of the Brumaire, part. like <laughs> I just want to sit back and listen to whatever you have to say uh, and, and, and not give a shit about it. whether or not it's related to what we're actually talking about. <laughs> Hence, we have a 40 episode fucking reading. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, I mean, you could get more of this from, uh, from you know, us chewing on this. Uh, Derek and I uh, recently read a book for Swampside on uh, like a reactionary text on uh, like, a, you know, managerial society. We'll also be talking about this on mortal science when we talk about like laws of history and whatever. But uh, I actually do want to move on to that last paragraph where, you know, he's, the, you know, first paragraph, you know, libs owning themselves and royalists owning themselves. And second paragraph, you know, <sighs> lumpen conspiracy, Alex Jones marks into... <laughs> into like awesome poetic flourish about, you know, 
the self own of the libs. And then the third part about the Cossack Republic. If you're a student of Russian history, the Cossacks are this like, you know, kind of quasi ethnic sort of like, I don't, I don't know how you describe them sort of cowboyish rancherish kind of like, Kind of, they had sort of, uh, sort of had a democratic culture. They had an on again, off again relationship with the Bolsheviks. I think they eventually got folded into the Soviet Union's like national kind of like pride thing. Um, could we get a little background on what that co- you know Republican or Cossack is about and what the Cossack Republic means? Were they, were they not like a kind of a warrior class as well? Like- yeah, they were a warrior class that claimed some like relationship to like basically asian step warriors <laughs> like mm-hmm. and so it's is that where the name know, for kazakhstan does kazakhstan come from cossack i always wondered i w- i think maybe it's the other way around i think kazak may be related to cossack but i'm not 100 sure on that i don't want to do folk etymology here one of the things i think is interesting about this is like it's basically the violent destructive form of the american yeoman republic which is also an impossible form because yeoman don't still exist but like it's a very similar idea like everyone thinks they're a Cossack or everyone thinks they're a yeoman, you know, live free. I can live on the steps. We can do whatever. And we have this like nascent, you know, quasi democratic tradition, as long as you're one of us. Um, uh, but I think in this particular case, what Napoleon was referring to was the threat of uh, Russian, Russian illiberal autocracy right yeah that's that, that's, that's the the, yeah. the opposition to the republic okay it's not so, he's not yeah. he's not really talking about the details of so it's illiberal it's Cossacks. illiberal it's illiberal liberal democracy which like you want to talk about rhyming with stuff right now like that's oh yeah 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 that's what the cossack republic is right is like it's it's the republic but with the kind of like degenerated autocratic nature of the russian empire uh, in it. So like, cause you know, for Marx, this is like a really important distinction, right? The, the French revolution versus, uh, Russian autocracy, like, cause he was like a big conspiracy theory guy about, about Russia. Uh, and like had that as like a job for a while, right? Is was writing con- conspiracy theory stuff about Russia. Oh yeah. So, so Marx, yeah. Russia, Russia is proto, uh, excuse me, Marx is proto Russia gate. And the reason why in part is the crushing of, <laughs> Yes. Like, uh, don't tell Glenn. Don't tell Glenn Greenwald. That'll make him more of an anti. Anyway. <laughs> but but you I know. Mean, but the the, the thing is that the like best part about Marx, to be honest with you, when you read him, it's like all right, this is more Alex Jones unhinged stuff. But it's like Democrat Alex Jones. It's like Rachel Maddow stuff. Like oh, on God, Russia. that's not better. Well, <laughs> I'm just saying he 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 whips out the chalkboard and makes oh, like a crazy God. ass mouth foaming conspiracy People theory. People need too. to stop whipping it out. Okay. Yeah, just keep it keep the chalkboard in your pants. But yeah, you know he's saying he's saying that that the Bonaparte has combined these two things that his uncle saw as antithetical. Yes. Okay. Can we move on? We've only done one, one on. page. Um, okay, <laughs> Esri, seeing that you're talking, why do you want to do you want to take this next bit? Yeah, let's fuck it up. Why did the Paris proletariat not rise in revolt after December 2nd? The overthrow of the bourgeoisie had yet only been decreed. The decree was not carried out. Any serious insurrection of the proletariat would at once have put new life into the bourgeoisie reconciled it with the army and ensured a second June defeat for the workers. On December 4th, the proletariat was incited by bourgeois and shopkeeper to fight. On the evening of that day, several legions of the National Guard promised to appear, armed and uniformed on the scene of battle. For the bourgeois and the shopkeeper had learned that in one of his decrees of December 2nd, Bonaparte had abolished the secret ballot and had ordered them to put a yes or no after their names on the official registers. The resistance of December 4th intimidated Bonaparte. During the night, he had placards posted on all street corners of Paris, announcing the restoration of the secret ballot. The bourgeois and the shopkeeper believed they had gained their objective. Those that failed to appear the next morning were the bourgeois and the shopkeeper. 
by a coup de main the night of December 1st through the 2nd, Bonaparte had robbed the Paris proletariat of its leaders, the barricade commanders, an army without officers, averse to fighting under the banner of the Montagnards because of the memories of June 1848 and 1849 and May 1850. It left to its vanguard, the secret societies, the task of saving the insurrectionary honor of Paris, which the bourgeoisie had surrendered to the military so unresistingly that subsequently, Bonaparte could disarm the National Guard with the sneering motive of his fear that its weapons would be turned against it by the anarchists. This is the final and complete triumph of socialism. Thus, Guizot characterized December 2nd. But if the overthrow of the parliamentary republic contains within itself the germ of the triumph of the proletariat, proletarian revolution, its immediate and obvious result was Bonaparte's victory over parliament of the executive power over the legislative power of force without phrases over the force of phrases. In parliament, the nation made its general will the law. That is, it made the law of the ruling class its general will. It renounces all will of its own before the executive power and submits itself to the superior command of an alien of authority. The executive power, in contrast to the legislative one, expresses the heteronomy of a nation in contrast to its autonomy. France, therefore, seems to have escaped the despotism of a class only to fall back under the despotism of an individual. And what is more, under the authority of an individual without authority. The struggle seems to be settled in such a way that all classes, equally powerless and equally mute, fall on their knees before the rifle butt. Mm. So this is quite dense. Uh, wh yeah, one of the things I want to talk about first off is Se has anyone ever God. Yeah, you, you knew you knew where my mind was going. Love it. Um <laughs> do, do, do you ever do you ever see Marx like um certain Marxist uses texts to, ju to justify the uh, abolition of the secret ballot, you know, when they invoke post-1921 Bolshevik reforms to voting? It's the opposite. How could you possibly how, well, yeah. we could, we could, I've you, never actually seen them deploy this text. I haven't this, either. I, That's why I'm asking, has anyone ever done it? Because I, I know that, for yeah. example, even, even a lot of Trotskyist groups do not use secret ballot and do open form slate voting based off of the, the post-1921 um, <laughs> Bolshevik voting structure, which did away with secret ballot and had slate voting. And... I've always wondered, like, how do you read something like this and think that Marx thought that would have been acceptable? I know, I know their arguments. They never invoke Marx. They talk about, well, you know, you yeah. need to have a you need to have accountability to the collective or whatever. So I'm like, so accountability to the people who already control the guns. Um, yeah, no, it's 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 to allow voter intimidation and to subvert democracy. That's what it is. Marx believed that that's that would be so, or at the very least, he acknowledged you know, that it would be so. He acknowledged it would be so, and he saw the secret ballot as something in the proletarian class interest, right? Like, and in and in you know a sort of just democratic class interest. Like, it's brought yeah, up it's, here. It's more about the sort of general procedures of of democracy than it is about the proletarian interest. But uh, like, yeah, he sees the value of it for sure. Proletarian is stretching it, but he, but he recognizes it as like a sort of democratic good that prevents this sort of intimidation. Right. <sighs> All right. <But laughs> I, I don't, I've been like, I, I'm just, I'm just interested in uh, like, th there's a lot implied here because there, there actually is a very complex notion of democracy, formal democracy in the state and law. Um, the other thing I'm thinking is there's a lot of people uh, in the kind of like wackadoo um, anarchist adjacent structuralist left who are now telling me that law law and credit precedes um, political power in the state and 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 which you know I've heard that before if anyone's ever read LaSalle because that LaSalle believed that that law was yeah. class neutral and but like how can you how can you I, I, I when I read a text like this, it's so clear that like it historically doesn't work that way, like at all. Like law, law, 
law, any law that pre-exists pre-exists for the class interest of the people who are currently in charge. And even and, and democratizing that law without abolishing it seems like to doesn't do much. Like it actually like makes it unstable and weird and more likely to be repressive. So I don't know. He just, he he, he um, like given the day that's in it with uh, the passing of our of our queen, uh, Miss Ruth. Ruth, what's her name? <laughs> Ruth, the the notorious RGB Ruth, G Ruth Bader, Bader Ginsburg. Ginsburg. RBG, yeah. yeah, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. RBG, RGB yeah. is the yeah. is the video signal thing. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking <laughs> Ruth, the Green notorious blue. Y, y the, the notorious CMYK. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, Marx nearly never mentions law too much, or the le like the the courts or anything in the entire book. It's just something that you pointed out today, Kyle. Yeah, well, the, it comes up very briefly in the discussions of like Napoleon's uh, appointees uh, and the struggle over the state. But I think it's also important to remember that Supreme Courts weren't really a thing yet uh, at this point in time. They 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 kind of uh, came about shortly after this period. Well, I don't I don't know how shortly, but you know it was it was just not really uh, the judicial power was not the same in France at this time as it is in the U.S. right now. It's just it wasn't institutionalized the same way, um, and so I think I think Marx treats it with a little uh, interest because it just seems like one type of bourgeois appointment among many others right this is also marks hearkening back to to uh chapter two where he kind of made the point that um why do you have a legislative authority that is decided upon by parliament i.e it's so the legislative branch is supposed to be assembled by a uh, representative uh average of the population Whereas in the executive branch, the entire vote is focused on one person. And so, like, of course, the executive power is going to win out in the end. Like, what the hell were you thinking? Um, and so th that's, that's kind of how I interpreted th this part as him, like, throwing back to, to his not overt, but kind of implicit prediction in, in chapter two where he was like, well, the legislative, you've ensured that the legislative branch is going to argue all the time, and you've made sure that the executive branch can make decisions at any time and veto shit and fire everyone in, in government and in the governmental agencies, and they also have complete control over the military. And um, we're, we're going to see, though, by the end of this chapter the contradictions of a unitary executive in response to like modern class society, right? Like that distinction between the legislature as a bunch of bickering bourgeois factions, or even in the original phase of, of the, the bickering between the royalists and the social democracy and the, the Bonapartists, um, and then on the other hand, you have, you know, the unitary executive, one person who embodies the whole nation, right? But then when we get to the yeah. end of this chapter, we're going to see when you have an emperor of a modern nation that is, is divided by a dynamic class conflict, he ends up having to do a, a lot of just kind of juggling, stealing, uh, stealing from one person to pay the next and desperately trying yeah. to keep the plates up in the air. Um, which is exactly how he gained power in the first place uh, by, by, by playing the mountain uh, against the party of order and playing the party of order against the bourgeoisie and playing the bourgeoisie against the party of order and so, and, and so on. I, I guess my, 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 my general point was, was merely that, you know, I, I don't think he's making a point that, that is anything like, Oh, Law is just a bunch of you know bourgeois bullshit, uh, or like uh, the, the parliament never does anything real. It's it's just arguing all the time. I think the point he's he's making is you've built a system where on the one hand, <laughs> to get Shizekin, like on the one hand, you have democracy, 
uh, embodied in parliament, but on the other, you also want dictatorship. Of course, dictatorship will win out in the end. Like uh, uh, th that's kind of that's kind of the the, the general gist of it. Um, yeah, but but law is not an ex is is not actually stem the way that this is written. Law law comes into the parliament too, as if it exists outside of a parliamentary procedure because it's because of the way because who has advantage in representation takes it into it and then codifies it. So in a way it all he's also proving that it was never really all that democratic either. And in the United States but, case, to go even further, the judiciary and law is separate from legislature. And common law is not like common law predates legislative fiat. Like like it, it's actually just assumed from common custom and in, in tort law which is true in anglo countries in a way that i think some europeans kind of forget that like a lot of our laws are literally customary and have been like and and are just assumed because of custom and tort around custom going back to like high period medieval europe yeah this is why no one understands anglo-saxon law <laughs> well, you, wanna, you know what's even weirder is when you, when you have the few states in the United States that operate off Napoleonic code as their substitute for Anglo-Saxon common law, those pe th those leaders always end up going to prison. So, like, 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 <laughs> oh my God. Well, no, I'm serious. Like, look at Louisiana. If you're governor of Louisiana, you have a almost like like flip a quarter whether or not you're going to go to prison at the end of it. So it's. The, the way the legal system works in the United States and uh, I mean, and the splitting of the judiciary from the executive, because I don't think I think that's unique to to U.S. inspired democracies like that's not totally true in, in, in the U.K. and Canada, is it like, like I'm not uh, actually it's uh, it's 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 somewhat more extreme in Canada. Uh, the hmm, interesting. The Supreme Court justices are more or less uh, elected by the bar. Uh, it's 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 essentially like the corporation of the lawyers and and judges who who uh, come up with the list and then choose the person on the list. And the governor general basically just gives the royal assent. So the PM and the legislature huh. have no involvement in choosing who is on the Supreme Court. And this is actually what ended up stopping Stephen Harper from conquering like full state power here. Like he he got into he got into government, he crushed the unions, he also managed to crush the state bureaucracy. And like basically use like Bolshevik tactics to uh, to 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 destroy them. Like he he built a uh, par parallel shadow government uh, to put them all under his uh, thumb. Uh, but the thing he could not beat was the corporate power of the lawyers. They had they just had too much social power, and he could not get the Supreme Court under his thumb because. Uh, of that that uh, autonomous power that they had, yeah, that that wow. So if, so if anything, it's further from the party machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the the legislative is even less uh, connected to the uh, to the judiciary in Canada than it is in the U.S. This is why I sometimes feel like the only Marxist who likes lawyers. Well, uh, I mean, you know, I'll give them credit for stopping Stephen Harper. You know that that dude almost killed my father. So, you know, I, I like oh, his, uh, his, uh, his 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 well. his his uh, efforts to crush the bureaucracy gave my father a heart attack, uh, and uh, oh, I do not, I do not bear any goodwill towards Stephen Harper. <laughs> he's, well, he's a bad man. person. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, I, I, honestly, I think uh, a lot of like the the hate against like any sort of legal stuff is a very American phenomenon. Like, usually, darn tootin'. It, for, for a lot of for a lot of countries, the, the the problem is is exactly the opposite that the <clears throat> the bourgeoisie and and capitalists get get away with illegal shit, and that 
lawyers don't have enough uh, fair trials um, and, and enough power. Uh, but like, you know, the, the U.S. is weird, is, is what I'm saying. Well, <laughs> well I mean, if, you make, if, you make, if you makes you feel any better, there's a lot of there's a lot of Marxists out here that are probably mourning uh, notorious BRG or whatever. Like, you know, so there, no, there's a lot of Marxists that love lawyers. If only like Marx, they had read uh, Democracy in America and and read a conservative being like, hey, don't worry. Democracy is just going to create this like uh, this, you know, pseudo aristocratic cast of lawyers that'll crush any popular will. Like so Marx Rip. is astute on that. Oh, I always tell people go read De Tocqueville because he's actually really, yeah. really prescient. No, he's great. What's happen in America. Like, yeah. you know, all this democracy is going to invert on itself and create weird aristocracies. I mean, and the other thing is, like, the American left liberals and also American labor, honestly, has learned through habitus that law is on our side because it's the only weapon we've been able to deploy since we can't politically unionize and our unions are captured. Yeah. And, well, and oh it, God. It, it, it's more like <laughs> it's more like a weapon that goes off and hits our enemies sometimes. Sometimes it hits us. And sometimes Easily. it hits our enemies. And well, that, like, that, that sounds oh, like your gun laws in general, though. <laughs> yeah, <they are. laughs> most of the time it's just <laughs> ooh, ooh, harsh. Hey, listen, at least at least there's at least there's like a, a rational Shots agent po- pointing Oops. those guns sometimes, like with oh, with yeah. <laughs> with po- like Supreme Court and like yes, you do have decisions from on high. Like, all right, let's not have like a uh, you know marriage apartheid it's, let's make a gay marriage okay now handed from on high praise be the mm. courts and then you set up a cargo cult around the court and then they do something <laughs> like strip basic ele- like campaign finance reform and then you're yeah. like uh, 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 I, uh, yeah, I must whip myself I mean, I mean, for the gods kind of I betrayed the is, gods is, is, is how like most of U.S. law seems to be entirely based upon Supreme Court predicates. It is. Um, the the and, Supreme Court had the right to define the law. Like the for the the Supreme Court gave itself the right to define correct. the meaning of the legislature, and it yeah. did so like kind of arbitrarily. It's not actually in the Constitution, but since no. it, it can interpret the Constitution, it can do it now. And no, and like no, nobody but. Unfortunately, the only people who've ever really opposed that have been like crazy wackadoo quasi Bonapartists like Andrew Jackson. On this episode, you heard the team tune. The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollars.